Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my impressions vlog covering the games that I played throughout the month of August 2018. As you can see, I have 12 of them that I'll be talking about here, and I've sorted them in mostly alphabetical order, and so you can feel free to skip ahead to the ones that most interest you, or stick around for the whole thing. Now before we jump in, I would like to briefly uh, request that if you enjoy this video, you consider clicking the like button down below, as well as the subscribe button. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this in the future, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. All right, let's now go ahead and jump into this list, and the first game is going to be Brass Lancashire. Now, you may be wondering why we're covering this one before Brass Birmingham, and the reason for that is that Lancashire is essentially a beautiful uh, reprinting of the original Brass with a couple small rules tweaks, whereas Brass Birmingham is a significantly altered Brass style game. So I'll talk about that one second, and let's start off with Lancashire here. Now, this one has been republished by Roxley Games with this uh, gorgeous artwork and production value all over the place. And what's going on in this game is you start the game with a hand of eight cards, and you have a board in front of yourself with a bunch of these little industry tiles on them. Now, these tiles might be ports, they might be uh, coal-making areas, they might be iron-making areas or cotton, and all of these things are tiles that you're hoping to put down onto this board of England in front of you. Now, every single turn, you have this hand of cards, and you're going to take two actions, and every single action involves you taking one of your cards and playing it into a discard pile. Now, right off the bat, this is starting to hit the things that I love about uh, many Euros, which is uh, what I like to call the one card uh, per turn Euro style, uh, like Concordia and whatnot, where you play a card, do an action, and your turn is over. Well, in Brass, you play two cards and you do two actions, which is somewhat similar. And the cards themselves are going to sometimes dictate where you can do different actions, and other times you just get rid of them so you can play something down that's not specific. Because what you're trying to do is you're getting these uh, tiles down onto the board, and let's say you put an iron tile down. Then you're going to put iron cubes on top of that tile, and as soon as all of the cubes are gone, then you're going to flip that tile over, and immediately the person who owned that tile is going to generate some income, which means they'll make money every single uh, round, they'll make more money, and everything costs money in this game, so that's very important. But also, you will generate victory points at the end of the eras of the game, uh, and victory points is obviously how you win the game. So you have this interesting setting where you're putting these tiles down, and then you're also putting these little canal tokens down to try and connect some of the tiles to other tiles because um, iron doesn't need to be connected, but coal does need to get connected to different spots, and the minutiae of that doesn't matter. What's going on here when what matters is that you can use other people's stuff. If I put a coal factory down, then all I really care about is clearing all the coal off so I can flip it over and get that income and get those victory points. And somebody else might use the coal that I have on the board to do something that they're doing. Now, if if they do that, then odds are good I'll be like, cool, I'm going to flip my tile over faster. Although there are many situations where you have a whole plan in your head and there's like two coal left on that tile and when it's your turn, you're going to do this which uses a coal and that which uses that other coal to flip over your tile and you'll be really happy. But suddenly other people have used your coal before it gets back to your turn and now you can still do your action, but now you're using coal from somebody else's coal plant and you don't really want to help them out. You want to help just yourself out. So now do you change your plan up and put another coal uh, spot down so that you can use just your coal or do you just suck it up and decide to use the coal from one of your opponents? Now uh, you can also buy coal and iron from a central market and again I won't go into the details of that but what this creates is a gameplay experience that is constantly having players reevaluate what is good for me right now? Because you're going to be uh, definitely strategizing out a plan as you're trying to uh, get these tiles down and flip them in various ways, and uh, in particular get a whole bunch of canal tokens down and then uh, railroad tokens in the second half of the game, uh, which will get you points and let you ferry stuff around. But as your opponents take their turns, you will realize there's just an opportunity here. Like, all of the iron is now gone. So maybe I should build an iron spot down instead of doing everything else I'd planned on my turn so that my opponents, when they try to do things that take iron, will be forced to use my iron. And another big part of this is that the market, once it starts getting used up, when you build a spot out on the board that creates that resource, you immediately refill the market and get money for those things. So you can <laughs> really do a lot of very satisfying uh, things as you're playing the game, and you're constantly jockeying around with your strategy to try and maximize 
the uh, benefit of what you're doing with each turn. Uh, I love the fact that the game has you um, making a long-term strategy and really thinking lots of turns ahead, but forcing you to reconsider your plans at every step of the way, which is probably why some people think that this game can go a little bit long because downtime is definitely a factor. And when you wrap all this stuff up, I really enjoyed my play of Brass. Um, Brass Lancashire in particular uh, with this first play. I was not expecting to like it at all. <laughs> when I went, uh, when I decided to uh, play this, uh, my friend said, hey, you want to play Brass? And I said, sure, this is probably a game that I should try at some point so that I can talk about it and I can uh, have that in the back of my head for analyzing other games and whatnot. But I was not expecting to like this game at all. What ended up happening is that I not only liked it, but I loved this game. And in fact, going forward, and this is going to spill, I think, a little bit into Brass Birmingham uh, when I talk about that as well, I've sort of had a Brass problem for the last month or so, where ever since I played that first game of Brass, every time I sit down to play games with friends, whether it be at like Victory Point Cafe or here at my house, all I really want to do is play Brass. I don't really know what's going on here. I've joked that like inside that box was there, there was some sort of curse that kind of reached out and got inside my head because suddenly I just want to play every other game less and I keep wanting to play Brass and I never thought that I would be that kind of a player. Like I've played lots of Martin Wallace games in the past and they're fine, they're okay. Some of them I like more than others. But for a game to latch onto my brain like this, that's super rare. So I think um, at this point, we should probably shift over and now start talking about Brass Burma him because they're uh, kind of in the same bucket, but they are two different games. So as I mentioned before, I played Lancashire a few weeks ago, and just a couple days later, I found myself at a friend's house. There were three of us, and we wanted to play a game, and I brought Lancashire and Birmingham with me because at this point, I am now borrowing these copies from the friend who owns them because he's out of the country for a little bit and decided not to check these in his bags. Uh, and so I brought these over, and I pushed to play them because it, Brass was just on my mind, and I just really wanted to try it out again, and we all decided to play Birmingham. Now, I stumbled through the rules teach for this one. It was the first time I'd taught a brass game because uh, in that original play of Lancashire, it was taught to me by the friend who owns these games. But also, I kind of stumbled through all of the additional stuff that uh, Birmingham brings into the brass system. Uh, on a very high level, uh, when you look at brass, the original, you have cotton that you can make, and then there are port tiles that you can put out on the board, and you flip over those together. You essentially deliver cotton to the ports. In Brass Birmingham, there are no more port tiles. Instead, you only have locations around the perimeter of the map that you can send resources to. And now you you don't just have cotton, you also have manufactured goods as well as pottery. And these locations around the outside of the map want specific things. Like you might have a spot that could take all three of those things or another spot that only wants pottery. And now you have to connect that pottery tile up to the spot that wants pottery so that you can flip the, um, the pottery over and then get all of the benefits for it. Now, I really like this addition because it means that um, the location of where you're putting these tiles down really matters because you want the, um, them to be as close as possible to the spot where you can actually deliver them, but you don't always have that option. So you're kind of doing a push and pull with where you can put these down that you didn't necessarily have with the original brass. Also, the original brass had a mechanism of uh, sending cotton away to foreign exports, and I won't go into the details of it, but Long story short, the earlier you did it, the better, and um, the first couple people who do it are going to get some benefits, and then it'll be just done. You can't use it anymore, so it's a bit of a race to try and ship cotton out early. Now, in Brass Birmingham, there are uh, there is no uh, market like that. Instead, what you have is an incentive to deliver to all of these exits soon because at the start of every one of the two eras in the game, you are going to put beer down onto those spots. And whenever you deliver a resource, you have to consume a beer. So that means you can use the beer that's just out there on the board. It's right there. And you also get a little bonus for using the board's beer. But later on, you can build breweries that make more beer. And then you can use that beer to do more deliveries once the uh, original board beer has been uh, removed, if that makes any sense. So the beer as a new resource is a Thing that you have to pay attention to because it is required for actually making these deliveries, especially the deliveries um, in addition to the kind of basic ones that you can always make at the beginning of each of these eras. Now, at this point, I realize I kind of glossed over a major part of Brass for both Lancashire and Birmingham, and that is the fact that you are going to play uh, two games in one, essentially. Uh, the game is split into two different eras, and this is the same for Birmingham and Lancashire, so sorry I didn't talk about it um, in that section. Uh, in the first era, you're building 
building canals. And then in the second era, you are building railroads that connect all of your locations up. But the big interesting factor here is that when you get to that middle point at the end of the first era, you then remove every single canal piece from the board and you score points for them based off of the kind of value of the tiles that they are connected to. And then you start the second era with a clean board again. There's just no connections at all. And now you have to build railroads to make all these connections and deliver stuff again. But the big difference between these two eras is that in the canal era, it just costs money to put your canals down. And in the railroad era, it also requires coal. So you're going to be using a lot more coal in the second era. And again, this is the same for both uh, Birmingham as well as Lancashire. But the difference for Birmingham is that in that second era, if you want to do uh, big double railroad build actions, you also need to use beer. So beer becomes this really necessary resource to make deliveries as well as put your railroads all over the place so that you can score a bunch of points for them. Now, when it comes to the analysis of these two games, I've played Lancashire once and I've played Birmingham two times now. Uh, and I really want to get back and play Lancashire again because um, I think, I suspect that I'm going to like Lancashire better. Uh, but after trying Birmingham out a couple times, I, I feel like most of my memory is now uh, dominated by the uh, things that happened in those games of Birmingham versus that original game of Lancashire. Now, the reason I think I'm probably going to lean towards Lancashire more is because that added complexity that Birmingham brings in is both nice and not nice at the same time. I really like the fact that you have um, the, you send the exports to the perimeter to different spots that like it. I honestly like the beer mechanism of consuming the beer to make those deliveries. I think that works out really well. The, the issues come into play for me is that things are a lot less streamlined in Birmingham, specifically with some of the other uh, resources. Like when you're building manufacturing, the cost to put a manufacturing tile down vary all over the place. And when it comes to putting pottery down, the first piece of pottery is super expensive and the next one is crazy cheap and the next one is super expensive. And so th these are not negatives. They're not flaws in the game or in, in any way. They're just extra things that you need to pay attention to and can trip you up. For instance, with the manufacturing, there's one spot that doesn't need beer at all, and there's another one that you deliver that requires two beer. And I've seen situations where people go to deliver and like, oh wait, that's two beer instead of one beer. I didn't see that little thing on there, and now my whole plan is blown up because I didn't see that tiny little double beer icon instead of the single beer icon. So it seems like Brass Lancashire is just more streamlined. It doesn't have as many of these, oh wait, but uh, moments as you're trying to play it, as you realize that the thing that you're doing is illegal for one reason or another. Now, I'm not against Birmingham at this point. Like I said, I feel like I need to play Lancashire one more time, and then I'll really have a decent idea between the two. But I really enjoyed my plays of Birmingham as well. Like I said, I've played it two times at that count, and uh, it, the game has just really pulled me in for all of the reasons that I already talked about for Lancashire. So part of me wonders if maybe this is the situation where I'll want to play one in certain settings and the other in other settings. I, I'm, I'm not super sure. I, I'm not convinced you need to have both copies of this game, but I'm, again, not convinced yet. <laughs> I might actually get there after playing Lancashire again and realizing that there are some things that I dislike about that that I'll want to play with Birmingham sometime as well. So I think uh, that's going to pretty much wrap up everything I have to say about Brass at this point. Uh, I've played it three times. It is dominating all of my uh, uh, desires to play games uh, over this last month. I keep wanting to come back to Brass. And I think this has been a bit of a disheveled overview. I apologize for that. This is a very uh, complex set of games to kind of go over in a vlog style format. But either way, uh, I'm very much looking forward to playing these more. Uh, <laughs> and I'm getting a bunch of new games coming in. And I'm still eyeing Brass every time we sit down to play a game. I'm like, well, is this the kind of situation where I can squeeze brass in again? And uh, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to get more plays of this one. In. All right, next up we have game number three, and that is Carson City, the card game. Now, this was sent to me by Quinn and Games, and it is obviously the card game version of the original Carson City. Now, Carson City came out in 2009, I believe, and I played it in 2010, uh, and I have not played it since, and I don't remember a whole lot about it. I, I know that there was a central board where you are building out uh, tiles to kind of build the city. Uh, you put like mountains down and various types of buildings. I know there's also an action selection track that you kind of move down and you could go into duels with each other where you would simultaneously reveal guns and you could kind of shoot people's uh, action pawns off different spots. Um, I remember thinking it was fine, but I never got back around to playing it again. And when it comes to Carson City, the card game, it looks like this is trying to streamline down on specifically the world building aspect of Carson City because you no longer have 
have duels or uh, really action selection at all. Uh, at its heart, what this game is, is a auction style game with um, uh, tiling in front of yourself. So you have all of these cards in the game and they're all split into uh, four. Uh, there are square cards with uh, four different spots on them. And every single round, you're going to deal out uh, four of these cards plus one character card. And then everybody has a hand of auction cards. Now you start each one of the two uh, phases of the game. Uh, you're going to uh, essentially do an era one and an era two. Uh, at the start of era one and era two, you'll have nine of these cards in your hand. And they go from one all the way up to nine. And when it's your turn, or I'm sorry, when it is everyone's turn, we all simultaneously select one of these cards and then reveal them. And then whoever has the highest card gets to draft one of the options. The second highest card gets to draft another one. And you'll go all the way through until everybody has picked up either one one of these terrain cards or the one character card that is available within that given round. And then the card that was uh, bid is put face up in front of you and then you deal out new cards. Now you only have eight cards in your hand and you do this again. So it's a very streamlined system that has everybody always in play because it's kind of a simultaneous blind bid. Um, and in general, I'm not crazy about auction games, but I do really like it when an auction game uses a depleting resource. Uh, to a certain extent, this kind of reminded me of High Society uh, because in that game, you have a hand of money cards and you are spending that money to try and pick up cards that are going to have victory points on them. And once you spend a card, it's gone. And the same thing is going on here in Carson City, the card game, because as you get deeper on into a round, you can look out to see all the face up cards that everybody's played so far. And you might realize that you have the only eight and everybody's played all their nines. And there's that one card that you desperately need. So is this the moment where you play that eight to guarantee that you're going to be the first person to be able to grab that? Now, when it comes to actually building out your town in front of you, um, you essentially have a lot of adjacency style scoring. Uh, you'll put cards down that have mountains and you put, might put a mine next to the mountain and that mine will give you points for being next to a mountain. Uh, you might put a saloon down next to a building and you will get points because that proximity is going to obviously thematically help out, uh, but also just the, um, the matching of these different things is really the goal that you are gunning for. And when it comes to actually putting these cards down in front of you, you're not just building out a uh, um, two by two by four by four grid, you are going to be able to cover over cards that you've previously played. Now, I've played games like this before. Uh, Honshu definitely springs to mind. Uh, in that game, you had a card with six different spots on it, and you could cover up old cards or tuck cards underneath. But in Carson City, you cannot tuck, you can only place on top. But it has a really neat restriction in that if you cover up a previous card, you can only do that if the icons match. So that means if I put this card on top of that card, I can only do it if the mountain on this card matches the mountain on that card. Um, if that isn't the case, then you cannot place that down. So it, it really has a expansion vibe to it. Like that mountain once there is there. You're not going to remove the mountain to put a brothel down or something like that. Uh, you're going to have to maintain that mountain when you then put down the next card. And so you have this growing area in front of yourself. And I didn't mention it before, but every single person is building their own area in front of themselves. It is a maximum of eight by eight in um, the grid. And you will just essentially go through these 18 rounds of bidding. You go through nine rounds and then you pick out the uh, second era terrain cards, which in general have more interactive uh, style uh, establishment stuff. It seems like in era one, it's very focused on making farms and making mines. And in era two, it's very much around uh, making hotels and banks and city halls and all that kind of stuff as your towns are growing. And yeah, you're going to do 18 of these and then you're going to score up your area. Now, I kind of skipped over the character cards. Uh, there's one of them available every single round to be grabbed and they do all sorts of things. They might give you end game uh, victory point modifications. They might give you a once per era uh, thing that you could do that kind of modifies how you draft the cards or which cards you're going to be taking. And they definitely add a lot of variety to the stuff that you're doing. But also in particular, they really add into the strategy of how you're trying to build in front of yourself. Like if you get a character who really likes mines and mountains, then you're going to be much more incentivized to draft those mines and mountains and add them into your area. Now, um, at this point, I should probably talk about another big aspect of the game, which is the virtual players. So uh, this game uh, plays up to six players, and the rules say that if you're ever playing with less than four players, you have to use virtual players to get yourself up to the four-player level. Uh, so in this case, I've played it once, and it was a two-player game. And it would not surprise me if this game is not best at two. Obviously, it goes up to six players, so it's probably not necessarily designed for the two-player experience, but... It was just me and a friend and we decided to give it a shot. So that means that it was me, my friend Mike, and then two virtual players because we, again, we had to get up to that four player count. 
And the way this game does the virtual players is really uh, well done. It's really smart because you give them a deck of the bidding cards. So it's one to nine if you're playing against novice um, virtual players. And then when everybody reveal their cards, you just shuffle up the stack for the virtual players and flip over their top card. And they just compete in line with us. And when it's their turn to pick one of the cards in the middle, they simply take the card with the highest appeal value, which is a little number that's on all the terrain cards and the character cards. And they just goes right over to the virtual player and they don't build a tableau. They don't use any of the scoring conditions for the characters they might grab. Instead, they just get victory points for that appeal value. If they take a card with an appeal value of nine, then that virtual player gets nine victory points at the end of the game. And so when everything is over and you tally up all of your conditional points based off of the proximity of this to that and that to the other thing, you then go over to the virtual players and you just add up all their appeal values and that's what they have and, and they can beat you. <laughs> so in this play, um, we almost, we, we thought that we had actually been beaten by the virtual players. It looked like when we added it all up that one virtual player had uh, more than me and then I came in second and then Mike was in third and the other virtual player came in fourth. But then I realized that there was one character that I just missed in all of the scoring and I scored him and I just barely beat that virtual player. But I have to tell you that for that like two or three minutes where I thought I had been beaten by the virtual player, I really enjoyed the idea that I had been beaten by a virtual player in a game. And even though I did end up actually having slightly more points than that virtual player, it was cool to see them competing. Like th their scores were definitely in range with the kind of stuff that we were doing. And that means that those virtual players, I think were designed and balanced in a pretty good way. Also, those were novice virtual players and you can play against intermediate and advanced by increasing their card pools by going up to um, 11 bids. Whereas all of the player characters always only go up to nine. So I think at this point, I've talked about this one quite a bit, but I will say that after one play experience at the two player count, I'm very impressed by what I saw. I think that the virtual players really work out well. Um, the, the rules even say that if you're playing with four players, you can continue to play with virtual players. You can play uh, with all the way up to six. Um, so having four people and then two virtual players going um, at it on the board is a totally legal way to play. And it's honestly something I'm going to consider doing because I feel like that all works out so well. So um, in general, I enjoy pool drafting style games and I like the um, depleting resource of the cards that you have in your hand, trying to jockey around and know when the right moment is to play that big one and the right moment to play that one to just get it out of your hand because you look at the tableau and you say, I don't know, they're all pretty much equal to me. I don't really care which one I'm going to take. So yeah, I think that's going to wrap up everything I have to say about this one. I'm, I'm looking forward to playing this one more, uh, specifically at higher player counts. It was a very enjoyable first experience with the game. Up next, we have game number four, and this one is Chivalry. Now, this game was sent to me by Transit Games, which is a Taiwanese publisher, and the idea for this game is that you are all knights, and you're trying to acquire the most attributes that you can. Uh, now, these might be things like honor, humility, uh, justice, and sacrifice, and the way you're going to be doing these things is by um, running around a rondelle in the middle of the board. So, out in the middle of the table, really, uh, you put a castle tile, and then you randomly put a variety of other locations face down around that castle. And when it's your turn, you are going to play a card from your hand down onto your player board. Now on that board, you have a red, a green, and a blue spot to play cards. And you have a red, a green, and a blue die that are associated with those locations. So if I have a red three right now and I place a red, die, a red card down, this means I'm going to move around the rondelle three times. Now you always go clockwise and you can sometimes duck back into the castle to evaluate that spot. But the other locations let you do a variety of things. Like you could land on the spot that says um, increase the pit values of all of your dice by one. Or another spot might say reduce your pit values by four in order to get your gold back, I believe, is one of them. So you are constantly manipulating your dice up and down, and those dice are what are going to enable you to move specific um, numbers of spaces around the rondelle. And at the end of the day, the way you get those abilities, like honor, valor, and justice, is you're going to have to orient all of your dice and your cards in special ways to match up with the cards on the tableau. So you might have a card out there that says uh, you need to um, uh, discard two cards from the cards that you've played already, and the color on one of them has to be a three, and the color on the other one has to be a five. So I just discard those two cards from my tableau and I take that one attribute and I stuff it onto my board and I get a little bit of a bonus and then I keep moving on throughout the game. So you are not only trying to customize uh, or modify your dice to match the abilities that you want to land on on the rondelle, but you're also trying to match those dice up to specific um, uh, situations to grab those cards that are essentially victory points. Now, some of these are a little bit uh, simpler than others. Like one of them says you just discard cards from your, uh, your discard piles until you've reached 
18 pips worth of cards. And that might be a lot of cards, or it might be just three cards if all three of your dice are at sixes. So you're trying to be as efficient as possible because every single turn you are playing these cards down potentially into that area. And you might have the dice lined up well, but that one card that you need to take requires you to discard three of those red cards and you only have one red card played so far. So now you are trying to play those red cards and the red is associated with a die value that might not be what you want. And so there's a lot of things that you are thinking about as you're putting all this together. But uh, at the end of the day, we played this once and it was a four player game, I believe. And while all of these systems did work, I have to admit that I didn't really feel super vested in it. Like, it's a very light style game, and everybody around the table enjoyed the experience, but nobody was necessarily hopping up and down about it, if that makes sense. Uh, I think it's a fine game, and I could see myself playing it again in the future, uh, but I don't think it's necessarily grabbing me, and I think uh, maybe part of that has to do with um, just... The things that you were doing out there, some of them are interactive. Uh, there's definitely things where you could go on a spot and force everybody to re-roll one of their dice. So if you had a plan, then now you re-roll that plan and the plan is now gone. So that's kind of a take that style thing, which I don't normally love seeing in games. Um, but at the same time, you might not have that one location. There's a big stack of locations and you don't use like four or so of them every single time you play. So some games I think will be a little bit more interactive than others. And I think this one maybe just plays a little bit um, into that interactivity a little more than I would necessarily like, but it's also such a light experience that I did not feel super vested. And it, honestly, I would not want that kind of take that thing in a situation where I was vested. So it's a bit of a uh, Catch-22 situation where it's like the game was not was a little bit lighter than I wanted it to be But if it was any heavier, I would have just gotten really frustrated with the uh, take that ness that going on there But overall, I think there are a lot of good things going on here It's uh, kind of a cool system of the rondelle matching up with the dice which you're trying to match up with the uh, Conditions that you're matching on the table. Um, there's definitely a lot of things to consider and I think some people are going to really enjoy this one uh, But for us, I think it might hit the table again, but we're not necessarily excited to make it happen Okay, next up we have game number five, and this one is Dude. <laughs> That's the name of the game, lowercase Dude. And I remember hearing about this one a few months ago, and uh, last weekend I uh, traveled down to San Diego and hung out with my friends, and we played a bunch of games. And one of the games that one of my friends had uh, is this very light party-style game where essentially everybody is given a shoveled-up deck of cards, and every single card says Dude on it, in a variety of different ways. It might say dude, it might say dude, it might say dude. <laughs> it says all these different, like the icons are big or smaller, uh, spelled in different ways. And the game is really simple. You just start the game, it's real time, you draw your top card, and then you just start saying dude in the way that the card says, and you're trying to match up with somebody else around the table who is saying dude in the same way that you're saying dude. And then once you both are looking at each other saying dude in hopefully the same way, then you both need to say sweet in order to confirm that you both think that, yeah, yeah, this is the right one. And you reveal the cards. And if they do match, then you get to score them. And if they don't match, then you throw them into the middle of the table and then you draw the next card. So realistically, this is just a setting where I think we had six of us around the table just constantly just yelling dude at each other for about 10 minutes until we all got through our decks. Uh, if you are saying dude, dude, dude over and over and you don't think anybody matches, you can just discard that card to the back of your deck and get to it later. So you're just cycling through and it was ridiculous. Um, there's really not a whole lot to say about this one other than the fact that uh, we all laughed a lot. It was a fun overall experience. I don't think it's necessarily an experience I will be seeking to replicate. Like I'm not going to go out and get a copy of this one, but also, I don't really play um, party-style games all that often, and I think that if somebody else had a copy of it and they suggested playing it in a setting that made sense with a bunch of people uh, wanting to play something light, I would play it again because it's it's just a fun experience. It's an excuse to laugh and be ridiculous with your friends, and that is exactly what happened when we played this one. Uh, I believe my friends are uh, testing this one out to uh, have it be played at their uh, wedding as part of the reception, like lots of light little games, and I think that's definitely going to work out really well for that setting. So it's very light. Likely I'll be playing Dude again, uh, but in a different setting uh, next time around. So yeah, that's that one. All right, let's now move on to game number six, and this one is Everdell. Now, this is a tableau building worker placement style game with ridiculous um, uh, production values in the box. You have this gigantic cardboard tree with cardboard branches and just bits all over the place. Uh, the resources are nice. The little berries are actually rubberized, so you can kind of squeeze them. <laughs> but when it comes to what you're actually doing in this game, uh, it involves hand management and tableau building for the most part. Uh, now, this is one of those games where you start off with essentially nothing. Apparently, there's 
a variant where you can start with a little bit more stuff, but we did not play with that variant. We just began the game with no resources and a hand of cards. And these cards all tell you what resources you have to spend to play them down into your tableau. And it seemed like really high numbers. <laughs> like, how am I going to get all these card play, cards played? Like, there's a worker placement aspect where you can take um, a small subset of workers and put one of them out into a spot to get a couple resources. But you can tell right away that you could send, spend, like, all three of your workers and maybe have enough stuff to build two of the large hand of cards that you have in front of you. But the thing is that as you start building these cards down, they can kind of combo off of each other in a couple different ways. Some of these cards will give you an ongoing bonus, like, you put a card down, and in the future, when you do something else, it'll give you a free resource of um, one sort or another based off of a condition. But other cards are essentially discounted. Like, they're kind of uh, comboed together, where if I have this one building in front of me, and I have this one character card in my hand, I can play that character card down um, for, I believe it was free. Uh, you could put that down um, at a significant discount either way. It's been a few weeks since I played this. And so what that means is you're trying to synergize some of the buildings you're putting down as well as the character cards that you're putting down. And all of these are going to kind of bounce around, give you various one-shot effects as well as ongoing effects. But for the most part, this game seems more oriented towards combos than engine building. And as we played through the game, we got more and more stuff down and I was able to do more and more stuff. And I found that to be very satisfying. Uh, if It honestly kind of reminded me of Terraforming Mars to a certain extent, because even though that's obviously very much an engine building game, uh, in both of these games, you start out with essentially nothing, and when you finish the game, you are going to be amazed at how much you were able to accomplish considering the uh, meager beginnings that you had. Now, uh, this game, when it comes to the worker placement uh, aspect, does something kind of interesting that I wasn't expecting. Uh, when the game was taught, I didn't really pick up on this until we got a few rounds in, um, because I used all my workers and I was ready to pull them back. And that's just something you could do. Um, it takes your turn and you pull your workers back. But when you do that, you essentially move into the next season for just yourself. So what that means is I moved into the next season while both of my opponents stayed in the previous season. And now I have workers and I'm placing them out and my opponents um, had not quite gotten to that new season, and once they pulled back, they would then jump into that spot. And again, it's been a few weeks, so I don't remember all of the specifics, but when you hit these new seasons, it does things like unlock new workers that you have access to, as well as, I think, one or two other minor things. But the ebb and flow of people pulling their workers back and then putting them back down again, and then going through these seasons is an important aspect to the game, and it was just interesting to see how we were all not locked into the seasons together. Because you're, I believe, just going through four seasons Seasons, and then the game is over. So you only have so many times that you're going to be doing this cycle. So you cannot just do this over and over again willy-nilly. You have to pay very close attention to make sure you're doing this um, when you need to be. So yeah, overall, I was quite impressed with the game. Uh, again, I went into it with no expectations for the mechanics. I just knew it was a beautiful, well-produced game. But when um, the game ended, I felt a very strong um, sense of tension and ownership of how I did. I was bummed that I didn't win because I thought I might have had a chance to actually win. I filled my entire tableau out. Um, but one interesting thing about the seasons is that I finished my last action and then walked away from the table for like 10 minutes while my opponents finished out all of their turns because... For one reason or another, I got significantly ahead of them in the seasons and the rounds, and they each had several more turns than I did. And when the game was over, I didn't win, but I was close to winning. So it's kind of interesting to see that I played like 10 less minutes, and I, I don't know if it was, I guess it was less turns. It kind of would naturally be, because you take one turn around the table, and I was just as competitive as they were after having taken many more turns. Uh, now, this is a game I would definitely enjoy playing again. I think I, I got some things right with the synergies and whatnot that I was building, but there are other aspects like these kind of uh, rewards that you're gunning for that I did not uh, participate very well in. And there's just a lot of moving pieces, although it's not a terribly complicated game, and I would certainly jump at a chance to play this one again if I had an opportunity. Let's now move on to game number seven, and this one is Metro X. Now, I picked this one up from Board Game Geek, uh, from the Board Game Geek store, that is, at the same time I grabbed Past Alley. Uh, they had a small selection of these uh, in their supply. Uh, this is published by Okazu Brand, which is a Japanese publisher, and the designer is Hisashi Hayashi, who has designed many games like uh, Okidoki and Yokohama and lots of others that are not coming to the top of my head right now, but uh, a very prolific, um, well-respected designer, I think, and I've definitely enjoyed both of those previous games that I just mentioned. Now, what's going on in Metro X is you have a roll and write style game uh, where the idea is something random happens and then everybody is going to do something based off of that. In this case, they pick up the pencil and they write down on their own personal piece of paper 
something that has to do with that randomness. Now, most roll and write style games involve rolling dice, but Metro X is a flip and write game where you shuffle up a deck of cards and you flip over the top card and then everybody does something with it. So what you're doing in this game is you are filling in these little um, station spots as you go across this Metro board and the little pad of paper has this all these crazy interconnected lines and what you're trying to do is fill these lines up as much as possible. Now, this is absolutely a puzzle style experience because on each one of those lines, you can input a maximum of two or three uh, numbers. And when you put a number into that spot based off of the card, if you flip over like a three, then you write a little three on the left-hand side of that line, and then you cross off or circle or indicate up to three stations down the line. But the catch is that if you run into any station that's already been filled in by another line that's coming through that spot, then you have to stop. So that means that you might only fill in two of those spots before you hit a break. And that means that you kind of wasted one of the, the three that you had available to you. And at the end of the game, you're gonna add up all of the spots that you did not fill in. And you look at a little chart and you're gonna lose some points. So you definitely want to be as efficient as possible and, and not sacrifice some of these points here or there. But the game is not always gonna give you that option. Now, this is a uh, very puzzly experience as you are trying to work your way around it because every one of these lines is pretty long. Some are longer than others, but they're certainly long longer than you could fill in with just two or three numbers in total because the numbers that you can flip over in that deck range from essentially a one, which is technically a star, and uh, up to a six. So what that means is you have to try and streamline these and kind of piggyback. So you'll kind of do this line up to this point, which just matches up to where you did this one, which means when you go through, you'll follow through and go to the next one. Because I don't think I properly mentioned this, but when you're filling in these numbers, you find the first empty station and then you start marking for that place. So you're just trying to weave all of these things in and not have annoying gaps of like one station between this line and that line because you might have to burn like a two or a three just to fill in that one spot. Now in this deck of cards, there are a couple cards that have a little skip uh, uh, word on them. They're circled numbers and those are rare and they do allow you to jump over to the next available station if you run into a spot that's already full. And uh, the last type of card, um, well, I guess there's a couple more in there. Uh, one lets you circle in anything that you want, but the last important one is the star. Uh, when you mark a star, you are going to find the first empty station and you'll write a number in there equal to the number of uh, metro lines coming into that station times two. And this is just gonna be raw victory points because at the end of the game, once we fill in all of the slots, which is about 23, I believe, you're gonna take around 23 turns. You are going to count up all of the uh, blank spaces and you'll lose points for those. You'll count up all of your star stations and the, you'll just get points for those. And the last thing is you have this race where you're trying to be the first person to finish out each one of these lines. If you're the first person to do that, then you get a bigger number of victory points. If in the future you um, complete one after somebody else has finished it, you get a smaller number of points. But realistically, all of the points come from finishing lines, uh, those star locations, and that's it. And then you subtract points for all the uh, missing spots. So you are desperately trying to finish out these lines. And every time I play this, and we've actually played this four times in this last month, um, it's seen the table a lot more than I expected. Um, every time we have played this, it seems like everybody has been enjoying it. But man, is this a complaining style game. Uh, we've joked that it should be renamed just regret the game because you will be so upset with the decisions that you made in the past. Uh, it's definitely one of those situations where when you go to draw the card, uh, especially in the mid to late stages, you flip the card over and half the table groans and throws their hands in the air and like one or two people is like, yes, that's exactly what I needed. And this game definitely brings in that um, that energy that I'd love to see in uh, this style of setting where everybody is playing simultaneously and you're all gunning for different things, but you're all working with the exact same uh, random input essentially. And then at the end of the game, you see who did the best. Now, as I just said, we've played this game four times over the last month, which is more than any one game usually gets in its first month. And inside the box, there are two different Metro maps. There's the Tokyo map and then the Osaka map. And I haven't even touched the Osaka map yet. I've done the Tokyo map four times now. And the Osaka map looks a little bit more complicated. It doesn't start on the left and go to the right. Some of them start on the top and go to the bottom. I'm looking forward to trying it because honestly, this game has really impressed me. When it comes to the wide array of roll and write style games, this is probably one of my favorite, if not my actual top favorite of them that I've played so far. And I think a big part of that has to do 
with the punishing nature that it comes into play when you don't streamline your actions and the great uh, rush that you feel when you are able to actually have these things piggyback off of each other. That puzzling nature really comes through and I just think it's a winner. Like everyone I played it with has enjoyed it. It got played twice last weekend with the same group of people because people enjoyed it so much and we didn't even try the next map. We just played it twice on the same map and it's definitely one of those games where in your second play, you will find yourself playing significantly better and differently than you do in your first play, because that first play, you can pretty much just throw it out. Like you, you will probably have fun with it. I certainly did. But you will get halfway through the play and realize how poorly you have understood the overall mechanics of this game. And coming to figure out how to use these mechanics right is a joy. And yeah, I'm looking forward to playing this one more. It's relatively quick. It's usually played in like 20 to 30 minutes. So it fits into that filler style uh, category. And I do see this one hitting the table more in the future. Up next, we now have game number eight, and this one is Polis. Now, this was sent to me by the publisher. This is a uh, game that has not been published in English just yet. It was originally published in 2017, I believe just in Dutch and Polish, and the English version is supposedly coming out pretty soon. Now, they uh, reached out to me, and I thought it looked kind of interesting, so they sent me a copy, and I played it at five players, and I think five is the biggest player count that this one supports. And what you're doing is you are kind of got a, a civilization-building uh, theme going on with tableau building as you put these surprisingly large cards out in front of you. Now, the main mechanic of this game comes into play with a auction. So the way the auction works is there are four different colors in the game, and everybody has a hand of cards, and uh, you can see the back of the card. Like, if it's a red card, the back of that card will also be red. And on every player's turn, they're going to draw a couple cards, and then they are forced to auction one of their cards. But the catch is that they auction it face down. So you can see the color of that card, but that's it. And then you put it down there and then you go around the table and everybody starts bidding money to try and buy and build that card immediately. Now, they might be interested in doing that because they understand the red deck is more about fighting and the um, the yellow deck is more about all the different characters and they might be kind of playing the odds. But another thing to keep in mind is that it just costs 10 money to play a card from your hand. So if you're able to bid and spend less than 10 money to buy that card, then it's probably a good thing because you're being efficient with your money. So what that means is we would start off the bidding and more often than not, the actual price got relatively close to 10 money because again, you can just play cards from your hand for 10 money, but you can only also only draw so many cards at the beginning of each one of your turns. So being able to buy a card and immediately play it on somebody else's turn is a nice perk. And uh, it definitely seems a little bit weird that you are spending money doing this auction, kind of um, going up and up around the table. You keep going until everybody but one person passes. And then you get the card and you flip it over and you're like, what did I build? And you put it up face in front of you. And now you get to do some stuff based off of that. Um, I know this turned me off a little bit from the game originally, but I wanted to give it a shot. And I'm honestly pretty impressed by it. I've been completely turned around on my opinion of this mechanic because I really like the fact that you don't know what that card is going to be because it adds some pretty interesting tension and surprise to the act of actually getting that card. I think if the card was face up, then everybody would be able to much better calculate exactly how much that card is worth to them based off the bonuses on the card and this and that and the other thing. And you would actually have a lot more downtime. But in this case, it's almost like a Christmas present and you have an idea of what that Christmas present might be, but you don't know exactly what it is. Um, and then you start spending money to try and get that big surprise when you play it in front of yourself. Now, a lot of these cards have little symbols on them and uh, they interact in different ways. So for instance, you might have a card that just gets you victory points every turn for every green card you have played. So now you just bid on that green card that's out there for auction and you don't even care what's on the other side. You just know it's a green card that's going to work for the synergies that you've already built up in front of yourself. Now, um, after you finish that auction, you can auction more than one card if you want. Now, you as a player are doing that because people are paying you for this card because then you can start playing cards from your own hand again for 10 money each unless you have some discounts. But you can only build, I believe, two cards a turn, which again, feeds into the idea of you wanting to buy cards on other players' turns. And then you move into a couple other really interesting mechanics. And in fact, when I was reading the rules to this game for the first time, I, I went into it with um, a, bit of, a bit of apprehension, like, ah, this looks like kind of a generic civilization theme. But I found as I was reading the rules, there were several times I was like, huh, that's cool. Or, huh, that's interesting. And one of those moments happened with the trade vase. So what happens is there is this symbol, which is a jar, and it is the trade symbol. And when it's your turn, you're going through all of these different steps, and one of the steps is trade. Now, what you do is you select one of your opponents, and you're going to trade with them. And what that means is you count up all of the jars that they have, and you take money equal to that. So they might have five jars. So cool, I take five money. And then that opponent 
count the number of jars that I have, maybe I have three jars, and they take three money. So it really is like a trade. I'm like utilizing the fact that they have a lot of jars. And what that means is if you get the most jars of everyone around the table, then people are incentivized to trade with you because if they trade with you, they're gonna get the most money. But if that happens, then you everybody's trading with you and you're gonna have tons of money. So that's, I mean, I mean, it sounds like it's a bad thing. That's a great thing. You want everybody to want to trade for you, with you. So you're trying to buy and have the most of these um, jars as you can. Um, it's definitely important not to slip behind too much in that because this is a big aspect of the revenue in the game. And then after you do the trade phase, you go into the combat phase where you select one person and you can attack them if you want. But interestingly enough, you cannot attack the person that you just traded with. So they have a little bit of immunity by having so many pots. Maybe they don't even have to worry about necessarily having a bigger military because they know that people are going to want to trade with them. And when the combat comes into play, it's 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 kind of interesting because you count up the number of combat tokens in front of yourself or symbols, and you count up the number of your opponent, and if you have more, then you win. Uh, you select one of the cards that is in their area. Well, first of all, you get one money, I think, for every card they have played in front of themselves, and then you destroy one of their cards. And that seems... Pretty take that, right? You're like destroying their cards. That's not fun. But that card that's destroyed is not discarded. It's turned face down and put into the history uh, area in that player's area. And then I, as the attacker, have to destroy one of the cards in front of myself that did some of that attacking. So it shows the attrition of war. So I got some money for killing their cards, and then I kill one of my cards, and I put it into my own history pile. And this is interesting because at the end of the game, there is a, um, a culture, I think it was called, a symbol and you will get one point per culture per card in your history. So that means if you have one of these culture symbols and you've had two cards destroyed throughout the game, then that culture symbol is worth two points. So you actually can generate points for having your stuff destroyed, and you can generate points by attacking other people because you're forced to destroy your own um, uh, hostile engine, and that card that you just destroyed can turn into points. So when we played this game, it ended sooner than I expected, and I, I had like three of these trade symbols in front of me, and I had zero cards in my history. I was actually bummed that nobody attacked me throughout the game, and I was bummed that I never really got around to building a military so that I could attack somebody else so that I could destroy one of my military cards and have it turn into points. So there's just all of the, that was definitely another one of those huh moments when I was reading through the rules, like, how interesting. And when we actually played it, there was a couple combats, but I feel like everybody was bumbling around in the dark as far as strategy. Like, we were all trying to figure this out and piece together what we wanted to do, but it, it had a very strange, different feel to it with this um, this turn where you're like drawing cards, and then auctioning cards, and then building buildings, and then uh, doing trade, and making income, and then attacking people, and okay, now you're done. Now it's the next person's turn. And it might seem like that would cause a lot of downtime. And honestly, I don't think four, five players was the best way to play it. Um, there was a bit of downtime uh, for it to come back around the table to you. But the fact that there's an auction every single turn means you are doing something between those turns and potentially somebody might be uh, trading with you or attacking you when it's not your turn. So there's other stuff going on there as well. So yeah, overall, I, uh, I've i only played it the one time. I don't think I'm going to play it at five players again, but I, I would like to play this one again. I think a lot of this stuff worked out uh, better than I expected, and I feel like I played very poorly. <laughs> it's kind of a strange situation, actually. I realized the game was coming to an end, and I felt like I was doing good. I had a good tableau in front of myself. I was getting a bunch of income. This stuff worked with that stuff. And then I had this epiphany moment where I looked down and I was like, wait, how many points do I actually have? And I was like, da, 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 okay, I've got like nine points. And I look over to my opponent across the table and it's like, oh my gosh, they've got like 20 or more points over there. I am so far behind. I didn't even realize it. Like I was having fun uh, winning auctions and building cards and putting that stuff in front of myself without even realizing that I had not been paying attention to the, uh, the winning condition of getting victory points. And that's the reason I think I came dead last out of the five of us. And interestingly enough, I had, I think, the most of the trade jars throughout most of the game. So a lot of people traded with me. But the person who won had the least. They ended the game with, I think, three trade jars. And I don't think anybody ever traded with them throughout the entire game. So obviously, that didn't put them at a detriment. They just had a really good synergy of the cards that they were able to, uh, I think, a couple win at the auction, but also play down from their hand. And they were able to um, just put together a much better victory point engine than I was. So yeah, I, I ended the game in dead last after enjoying myself and I have definitely talked about this one too much here, but either way, I'm looking forward to trying this one again and exploring the systems that are going on in there even more. Next up, we now have game number nine, and this one is Rialto. Now, uh, this is not a new game. It came out in 2013, which was kind of uh, the year of Feld. Uh, I, I know that uh, Rialto came out that year, Bora Bora, Amerigo, as well as 
Uh, Bruges also came out that year. So just a lot of games designed by Stefan Feld. And I feel like Rialto kind of got overshadowed by some of those other ones. Uh, now, I picked this one up in 2013, so I've owned this one for about five years, and I played it twice back when I first got it, and did not play it forever until this last month. So I finally got to play it again, and that's why I'm talking about it right now. And honestly, this game has been on the chopping block for a couple of years now. Uh, you know, pretty much every time I look to my shelf and I'm like, I have to remove some games, I have to get rid of some games to put the new games in, I look to Rialto and I'm like, I gotta play that game one more time. I, I just, it's sitting there. I don't wanna get rid of it just yet. I have to play it again, and then I'll decide whether or not I wanna keep it. And the reason I've had a trouble getting this one to the table is because the first couple plays that I played back in 2013 didn't go super well. Like they were okay, and I definitely enjoyed those plays, but the people I played with are people a part of my general board gaming group. And it got to the point where as time went on, every time I'd be like, hey, what about Rialto? Let's try Rialto again. There'd be somebody who was like, oh no, that game was terrible. I don't want to play that game again. And then anybody else who was like thinking about maybe trying it was like, oh, maybe I don't want to play it either. <laughs> and so it was like this kind of vicious cycle where I just could not get this game to the table again because it had had such a poor first impression for a couple of my friends. Now, I uh, I finally decided to do something about that. I was, I think, lamenting about this a few weeks ago to some uh, other friends that I was playing games with, and they said, oh, I'll give it a try. So I brought it out, and we got to play a three-player game of this one. Um, this ended up being with uh, my wife, Jessica, as well as my friend, Paul. And <laughs> I've talked about this a lot already, but I haven't talked about the game. So what's going on in this game is you have a hand management style situation, uh, and you have, um, I believe it's Venice in front of yourself with six different locations, and you randomly put these numbers tokens on them, and every single round for the six round game, you will move to the different spots. And within each one of these rounds, you will do things like build buildings, activate buildings, uh, you're going to uh, generate counselors, you'll put counselors down into the different island areas, you'll put bridges down as well as gondolas, and when the game is over, you're going to score victory points, and it's just area majority. You'll check each one of those six different islands, and the person who has the most counselors gets um, all of the points that are indicated by the bridges and gondolas pointing towards it, and then the second per most person gets, I think, um, the amount that the first person got halved, rounded up, or something like that, and then the third person gets halved that again. So you definitely want to vie for these. But by far and away, the most interesting aspect to this game, and the thing that really made me want to come back to it, is the card draw mechanism. So you have a hand of cards, and every single one of the six rounds of the game, you're going to draw a hand of cards. But the way it works is you actually deal these hands of cards face up in the middle of the table in rows. So you can see every single card. You put one more row than the number of players, and then there is this doge track, and you start with the person who is, I believe, farthest on that track, and they get to draft one of these hands of cards. Uh, they looked at all the different options with all the different symbols on the cards, they select one, and then you go to the next player. Now, honestly, I can't remember if it's the doge track or just clockwise from that point. It's been a couple weeks since I played it at this point, but either way, each person is drawing up these hands of cards from a smaller and smaller pool of face-up hands of cards until you get to the last person who can choose between the two options, and then you go into the main meat of the game, where you do these different steps and you play cards out in front of you and you do these in player order and the person who plays the most of that one type of card gets a bonus. So that means if it's the money round and I put three money cards down and you put two money cards down, then I get three money, you get uh, two money because you play those two cards, but then since I played the most, I get a bonus, which I believe is one more money. So I'd actually get four money in that respect. And then you can use money to activate your buildings to do a variety of other things. So you are constantly vying to try and um, put the most cards down in the specific categories that you can, but there are, I believe, six different categories that you do each round, and you're not going to be able to compete in all of those. And some of these cards are jokers, so you can use them to kind of beef up one bid or another. So it has this really interesting aspect where everybody's kind of always taking turns at the same time, and you are just trying to play these cards in such a way to get the stuff that you need, but also trying to draft the cards in such a way that you have the right types of cards to be able to do the things that you need to do. Uh, in the game we played, a couple of my opponents ran, oh, I think both of my opponents <laughs> at one point ran out of money and were not able to draft a hand of cards that had money in them, which means they couldn't make extra money in that next turn, which means they couldn't activate their buildings because activating buildings costs money. And they found themselves in a little bit of a, a pit there, but then in the next turn, there was some money out there on the cards. So they drafted according to that, like I desperately need money. And so they went after that and they got that and we just kind of kept rolling with the game. Now, I think I won that game relatively solidly. I don't super remember, but I do know that I really enjoyed this third play. It's been four or five years since I played it at all. And uh, both Paul and Jessica actually really enjoyed this game as well. Um, 
Actually, I don't know if it was really. I don't want to put too many words in their mouth. But when the game was over, they both seemed quite happy with the experience. And they both seemed interested in playing this one again. So Rialto has officially been uh, taken off of the chopping block. I did like it enough uh, that I'm going to keep this one around. Because I think it does some interesting different things that I just don't see in that many other games. In particular, I just love the idea of drawing your own full hand with full knowledge of everybody's hands of cards, man. It's just so cool. And you don't even have to worry about memory too much because after you draw those cards, you always draw a couple more cards from the top of the deck and then you discard down to your hand size. So you, um, if you try to memorize everything that's an option out there, that isn't even going to help you because some of those cards might be discarded for other ones that you didn't see. So yeah, if this game really came together well. I'm happy that I still own it. And I'm hoping that this one will see play uh, more often than once every four to five years anyway. At this point, we've reached game number 10, so we're working our way well through this list, and this one is Thunderstone Quest. Now, this was published by AEG, and they sent me a copy of this game, and it's actually the third version of Thunderstone, to my understanding. Uh, the original Thunderstone came out, I believe, back in 2010, and I played it a couple times back then. It was kind of like the second uh, deck builder uh, to Dominion, uh, and the idea of it then, as well as now, is you had a deck builder style game where you have a little bit more, where the theme is a little bit more prevalent, and you you are um, putting adventurers into your deck and you're putting weapons and items into your deck and then you can equip the weapons onto your adventurers when they come out in the same hand and then you can send those adventurers into that deep dark cave and try to kill some monsters and get benefits for doing that. And then once everything is over, you count up your victory points just like Dominion and you see who won, but it definitely had a much stronger thematic vibe and connection to it. But the setup was a bear. Uh, you had these adventure stacks with level one adventures over the two, over the three, and you had all these different items. And it just, it took a while to set this game up and break it down. And I enjoyed it back then. And then Thunderstone Advance came out and uh, a few years later, and I never played it. I honestly don't know what it did that's different between it and the original game because I just moved on. And then finally, Thunderstone Quest just, I think, uh, released recently. And this is the third revision and it brings a lot more stuff into play. First of all, this box is gigantic. Um, it's like, I think I waited. I think it was like uh, two thirds uh, or three quarters of Gloomhaven. Uh, it was like almost as big as Gloomhaven. The box is like that big, like that. And it's just full of cards. And um, it has a campaign scenario type thing built into it. But from what I can tell, it's not so much a campaign that you're going to make decisions with and more like a story that is linear. And then in each one of these story packets, you will pull out different subsets of cards and enemies and items and adventurers that you're going to be playing with. And the game has I didn't count them, a, a shockingly large number of these different scenarios that you can play with uh, to the point where I actually have left most of these cards in shrink wrap because there's got to be thousands of cards inside this box. So I just opened up all the basic ones and all the ones for the first scenario. And even that is a pretty good variety of different monsters and adventures that you can choose from. And I've had this one for honestly a month or two at this point, And I was a little bit reticent to get this one played with like three or four uh, players at a game night because it seemed like the, uh, the setup time would take a while and I felt like I would stumble through the rules. So I kept telling uh, Jessica, actually, I was like, we got to play this two player. Like the first time I want to play this, um, I want to play it just with her. Uh, Jessica loves deck building games. So that just kind of made sense. And we finally found the time to get this one played. And I have to say that we both really enjoyed it. And honestly, I enjoyed it a lot more than I expected to. Not that I didn't think I'd like it, but I really enjoyed the experience. The act of uh, building up those adventurers, leveling them, uh, them up inside of your deck, but also bulking up your deck in a variety of other ways, and then moving around a dungeon. Um, this game in Thunderstone Quest, you actually travel with a little miniature throughout a dungeon as opposed to just having a line of a couple cards. And uh, fighting those different monsters in different ways just was very satisfying, like much more than I expected it to be. Um, and on top of that, this kind of goes back to what I talked about Polis earlier. Um, in Thunderstone Quest, it has this thing that I, I don't remember if it was in the original Thunderstone or not, and that is a treasure deck. Now, when you're fighting a lot of these different monsters, one of the rewards for killing them will be a random treasure from the treasure deck. And it's this deck, it's about that thick, and it's got a variety of powerful cards in there. And you draw random from the top, and you put it right into your deck, and you don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to add to your options. And just like in Polis, where you are trying to uh, bid on auctions to buy cards that you can't see the, the front face of it, in that game and this game, the randomness of that kind of adds variety and freshness because you're like, oh, cool, I got this big spell now. Well, I guess maybe I should try and get more of that adventure that works really well with spells because I randomly got this spell. So you can kind of try to uh, 
orient your decisions based off of the randomness of grabbing these powerful cards, although you're pretty much never going to be sad about any of those random cards that you get. And the uh, the, the fun of kind of flipping it over and seeing what you're about to get is a, a definite attraction um, in this game as well as what I talked about in Polis. Now, um, at the end of the day, we kind of wrapped up the game after playing it for a while. It took, it took a little while, but we were playing slowly and just enjoying each other's uh, company as we progressed our way through this. Um, we, we talked about it quite a bit, and we both discussed about how we really enjoyed it. But I realized that I think I never want to play this with anybody else but Jessica. Uh, in particular, I think I don't want to play this game more than two players. Um, and that's just because of downtime. Like The turns don't take that long to process, but you aren't doing anything when it's not your turn except just watching somebody else. And there are some turns where you're doing a bunch of different combo stuff, which lets you do this and pull more cards out and do that. And now you can actually move over here and do that other thing over there. And you're doing a whole bunch of things. And it's fun to watch an opponent doing this. But I feel like if I was playing with four people, it would take a while to get back to me. So I've we, we've discussed it and we've decided that this is a game we both definitely want to play again. Um, and it might even be a bit of a go-to game for the two of us when we want to play a game, just the two of us, when nobody else is over. Um, the, the, the fact that we won't have to keep teaching the game again, not that it's a hard teach, but that is a, a big perk for us. So yeah, I'm looking forward to playing Thunderstone Quest more, uh, to seeing how all of the other um, cards interact. And I have no idea if we're ever going to get through this gigantic box over the course of the next three decades or something like that, but I do know that we want to play this one again because it was a very satisfying deck building experience. At this point, let's now move into game number 11, which is Trash Pandas. Now, the publisher for this one is Game Right, and a friend of mine owns this one, and we played it last weekend. And the idea of this game is you are all raccoons, aka Trash Pandas, and you are trying to dig out the most trash that you can and stash it, and at the end of the game, see who has the most points. Now, you're going to get points by having the most of specific types of trash stashed um, in a face-down pile, and so you are not really sure if you are winning these majorities or not as you are stashing the stuff in. You're certainly trying to. And the main mechanic for the game is push your luck. So you have these uh, six different action options and a single D6 with one face for each of those actions. And when it's your turn, you roll the die and you will take a token equal to the, uh, the face on top of the die and you put it in front of yourself and you can stop and then do that one action or you could roll the die again. And as long as you don't hit the token that you already uh, have, so as long as you don't hit the same result twice, then you take that next token and put it in front of yourself. And you can roll the die again, and then take the next token. So the more you roll the die, the less likely you are to hit a new die face, and if you hit doubles, then that's it. Your turn is over, and it's the next person's turn, and you busted. So you have that uh, tension of the push and pull, and these actions let you do things like draw more cards, stash cards in front of yourself. Um, you can also steal a random card from an opponent uh, from their hand. Uh, and there are a couple other things that are going on here, um, but the cards that you have in your hand can be stashed or they can be played at specific times to do various effects that are printed out on the card. Now, this is a pretty interactive game. Like, there's definitely cards that let you um, interact with your opponents. Obviously, I already said you can steal cards from opponents. Um, there's a card that lets you steal a card from their stash, as well as um, a couple other minor take-that-style things. But the, the big tension from this game comes from the pusher luck. And I think um, we played a four-player game of this one, and at the end... <sighs> I don't think anyone necessarily had a great time with this game. I think um, uh, some people enjoyed it more than others. I was kind of in the middle camp because it seemed like the push your luck bit, uh, the, the penalty for busting was huge, right? You just lose your entire turn. And this is a luck game. And there were several times where I saw an opponent roll the die once and then roll the die a second time and hit the same thing they hit the first time. Boom, their turn is over. And of course, maybe they shouldn't have pushed their luck, but the odds were really low of that happening. But that seemed to happen several times for two of my opponents in particular. I had great luck. I don't think I busted once the entire game, and it wasn't like I was stopping after one token after every single turn. I was going to two or even three a couple times. And I know there are also cards you can play to force your opponents to roll the die again to cause them to bust, and I know that happened a couple times. And if I'm being honest, when that happened, the person who was forced to roll again in the bust was not having a ton of fun with that. It was like, oh, okay, well, there went my whole turn. I had plans and all right, now it's not my turn anymore. And it kind of kept going around the table and it just seemed like the interaction that happened in this game was not really jiving uh, super well with the group that was sitting there at the table. Um, I know I wasn't super into all that and I felt kind of bad. Like I was just getting great luck and my opponents were not necessarily getting great luck and I was stashing so many pieces of garbage in front of myself and everybody was just convinced I was going to win by a landslide. But interestingly enough, when the game ended, my friend Josh actually won because I think I put 
four of the bananas into my uh, trash. And for most of the different type of things that you are vying for, there's a certain number of points for first place and a certain number of points for second place. And I had one less banana than Josh. And the bananas in particular only give you points for first place. So that means about half of the cards that, put, that I pushed into my, put into my stash did not give me any points at all. And I, I lost the game by a couple points. So it did not seem like my streak of great luck as far as the die was concerned meant that I was guaranteed to win the game. Maybe I should have played it differently or uh, played around the bananas in certain different ways. But overall, I think that this is a game that I could see myself playing again if everybody else around the table brought it out and they were really excited about it, but it's not one that I am going to be uh, actively seeking out to uh, own or uh, play again in the future. All right, we've now reached game number 12, which is the final one I'll be talking about in this vlog, and this one is War Chest. Now, this one was sent to me by AEG, and I was pretty excited to get this copy because I'd already heard a decent amount about this game. I saw a good chunk of a playthrough that Paul Grogan with Gaming Rules made on YouTube. I've seen a bunch of other photos and just buzz about it because in this game, you have a kind of abstract um, uh, chess-like fighting board in front of yourself with a bunch of different hexagons, and you are moving your units around and the units um, per, per, uh, behave in different ways, like some move really fast, some attack better than others. But the uh, core mechanic for the game is bag building. You have a bag and you put these units, the actual tiles themselves, that are like these really nice thick kind of poker chip-esque things. You put them into your bag and at the beginning of every round, each person pulls out three of these tokens. They keep them uh, hidden from their opponents. And when it's your turn, you're going to do one of these three actions. And once everybody's done three actions, then you draw three more out of your bag. And if you don't have an Enough, then you put all of your discarded tokens back into the bag. Now, the things that you're doing are um, pretty simple. Uh, one thing you could do is spend any token to buy a new token from your own personal pool and put it into the discard pile to then find its way back into the bag. And every single time you're playing this game, you're going to have um, different sets of these units. There's 16 units total. I believe in a two-player game, each person has four units. Um, but I played it in a four-player game, which is two versus two, and each one of us had three units that we were able to pick from. Now, the uh, next thing that you're able to do is actually activate the units themselves. And this is the only way that you move them around and activate them on the board. Um, you have to have that unit out there and then have that specific unit's token in your hand. You play that token into your discard pile to move the unit and then maybe fight or do various things based off of the abilities of that unit. But what it means is you have a abstract um, combat kind of dudes on a map style game but it's hamstrung by the tiles that you have in this bag. So it's not about, you know, chess or checkers type of thing where you can move anything and you're trying to work your way around in specific ways. Here, the kind of beating heart of this game is the bag. And so you might desperately want to move this one um, token because it's about to get attacked, or it's just a perfect position to move over there and do an attack. But if you don't draw that token out of the bag, then you can't activate it. And so this also leads its way into the tokens that you're drafting into your bag. Do you go for a wide variety or do you just try to take all of the tokens of one type so that as you're cycling through your bag, you're hitting that token over and over again and you're moving that one unit around like crazy on the board, but not really moving any of the other ones. Now, the end goal of this game is you're trying to control a certain number of these little nodes on the board. And if you control a certain number, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, then you're going to win. And it seems like this game was most likely designed as a one versus one experience. But the one situation that I played this in so far had four players. So we decided, ah, why not? Let's try it at two versus two. And I don't think I necessarily recommend that for a first game for anybody in the future, but everybody enjoyed it. So I guess I take back that hesitancy. Uh, I think it's definitely going to show itself best uh, for new players at one versus one, but it did work technically with uh, the uh, two versus two. Um, the big difference here is that since everybody has three units, that's going to be 12 units total out of the uh, uh, 16 versus the uh, four and four. So eight total out of the 16, if you're in a one versus one situation. And so with 12 different units on the board, you have to remember which units are your units and which units are your opponent's units, because they're yours that you can move. There's your um, uh, partners across the table that they can move. But we found that since the board state kind of grew organically as the game went on, like it started out very empty and it kind of got more and more full and things moved around, that I was never really mistaken by if this was my piece or if this was my opponent's piece. 
But either way, I was really impressed by it. Uh, in general, I'm not a, a big fan of games where I'm just moving dudes around on a map and um, killing things off and trying to vie for position. But the fact that it had this bag building mechanic um, in there, which kind of forced the, the play and the decisions in a variety of different ways, uh, really made it feel fresh and it made it a situation that I think I'm going to want to experience again. I definitely want to try this out again. Um, I might play it again at two versus two, or maybe I'll find myself in a situation to play it one versus one. But either way, I've been really impressed by it. I think it's a, a solid package. It's a pretty fresh idea and um, a combination of all these different ideas. And uh, it was fun to see everybody else around the table enjoy it as well. So yeah, I'm definitely hoping this one sees the table more. Okay, with that, we've now reached the end of this vlog. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion overall. I feel like I was maybe a little bit more rambly than I normally am and slightly less uh, coherent with some of the points I was trying to make, specifically about brass. There's just so much to talk about about brass, and I'm so strangely excited about it that I'm not sure if I really explained it all that well. But uh, either way, I hope um, some worth was uh, taken out of it by uh, you, uh, if you watched that section or not. Uh, and uh, going forward, looking at the next month, I'm not sure if I'm going to hit 12 new games to talk about in the next Impressions vlog, but I do have quite a few new ones coming in. Um, uh, one in particular, Teotihuacan, that one showed up just a couple days ago, but I haven't had a chance to play that one yet. So I'm hoping to hit that, uh, have that one hit the table uh, um, possibly even tonight, and then maybe a couple more times uh, throughout the next month, if possible, so that I can talk about the final release version of that one. So yeah, that I think is going to wrap this one up. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support these videos, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please consider clicking the like button down below, as well as the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.